I never had any expectations to publish anything on the Rolling Stones. Like many, they were my second favorite band. But, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't qualified, really, to write on the Stones. That didn't stop me from working on the Beatles. Uh, but there was a deeper connection between me and the Beatles then with the Stones, who I felt were, like, great, but not that deep, not that sort of life-changing in any of the vistas that they revealed to the, the open listener. But it turned out that I did write about the Rolling Stones because people wanted me to in the publishing world. You know, what are you going to do next? Well, of course, I did that Brian Jones book that was turned into the movie Stoned in 2006 with Stephen Woolley and Nick Powell, who did The Crying Game, Interview with the Vampire, famously. So, um, did a book called, what was it called? Ah, The Rolling Stones, 40 Years of Music and Memorabilia, I think. It was also called Not Fade Away in Other Countries. Mm -hmm. But now it's been retitled as Screwed, The Rolling Stones. What was Screwed? What, hold on. Just pull the paper out. Let's see. The call? Screwed, The Rolling Stones. It's perhaps more apropos than any of the other aforementioned titles, which... By and large, the publishers contributed to. Yes, folks, behind every editor and every publisher is a frustrated author, and they try to inflict that um, on the person who's actually doing the work, and you have to work around that because they give you the money. Yeah. So I did this book, but then again, I didn't have a big collection. I'd already done two coffee table books of my Beatles collection, which people are familiar with for sure. Um, but I didn't have a Rolling Stones collection, so how am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? Um, so what they did was the publisher, Dragon's World, uh, used, to, used to work with Hypnosis. Hypnosis, yeah, the big designers that are, you know, very lauded today. And even back then, they did all the Pink Floyd covers and stuff like that. Um, so in, in connection with that, Dragon's World, uh, I did the book, and they found a collector who... I'm not sure still with us, called Chris Eborn. And Chris Eborn was the same kind of, to the Rolling Stones, what I was to the Beatles. He had this huge collection. And uh, they photographed it. And then I, wrote, I, I supplied a 20,000-word narrative uh, for the book uh, under the auspices of an editor called Pippa, who was absolute horror to work with. I, God knows where any of these people are now. Enough water's gone under the bridge that I can unburden myself and tell you about the, the trauma that I uh, experienced as an author. And perhaps those who worked with me feel the same. I don't know. But anyway, so I did this book. It came out. It was all this really great Stones collection. What's really interesting about this book is it came out when the time that Oasis was so, so big and breaking and everywhere in stadiums. And they were on MTV. I didn't see it, but my phone certainly rang. And they had been asked, Oasis, in an inter interview about the Rolling Stones and the guys, you know, in their own kind of rough ways, oh, fuck that, you know, there's only one book in the Rolling Stones, and it's this, and they held up the book by Jeffrey Giuliano, this is a fucking book about the Stones, and then later, uh, Keith Richards, of course, there's been many big Stones compilation books of collections and so forth since then, but mine was the first, there's something about being the first, there's, you know, maybe it's not up to even if the quality wasn't up to what later comes, you're the first guy to do something. So that's the first Big Stones coffee table book ever. Keith Richards said the same thing. As a matter of fact, I got a letter from the publisher saying that we were going to, with a check, saying that the Rolling Stones had um, licensed some of the layouts for their tour program, which I never got a hold of, but I certainly got a hold of that check. Um, with the Rolling Stones logo on it. That was cool. It wasn't signed by the Stones or anything. Some accountant. But um, that, it's a big, thick 
beautiful book. None of the stuff was mine. It was poor Chris's, had significant health challenges thereafter. Um, but I did write the narrative, kind of cheating in a way, isn't it, really? That, you know, it wasn't my stuff and they just kind of used my name because I'd done the other books and wrote the narrative. But, you know, it was considered, it was a well-considered narrative. And I spoke to Bill Wyman. I spoke to the parents of Brian Jones, from whom I got quite a bit of memorabilia, actually. Um, went down to Cotchford Farm. I kind of smushed together the research for Painted Black, The Murder of Brian Jones, and then this Rolling Stone book together. They were done in the same period. And then kind of used that interchangeably, the, the research that I did. Again, as is my MO to interview people that had not been interviewed before, although it wasn't strictly a, an interview book. It was a narrative, written in narrative style. It, uh, it utilized the same method of research. So now that's a little bit tougher to publish online and print on demand because it's a big coffee table book. And when I last looked into it about four years ago, the technology wasn't quite there to do those. Um, but I'm almost positive that it's come up now with AI and everything so that th all things are possible. So that book will be coming out again in 2024, fingers crossed. And it's a beautiful document about, especially about the memorabilia of the Rolling Stones. I mean, obviously it stops at around 2000 and about 2000 when maybe the book was published or the very end of the 90s, but still there's a lot of stuff. And especially that old, that old uh, classic stone stuff that we all love and that music too. There's tons of memorabilia from there. And then, you know, snippets of my interviews with various people. So it's a worthy project and one that I hope we can all enjoy uh, in 2024.